because this one was a strange one, man. This is a really strange one. Strange how so? Because it's the way people reacted to it. Oh, yes. The reactions I saw. Um, from people who were at least nominally Catholic. Catholic. And such a lack of understanding of, of, of like the severity of this. Like this is not this is exactly what we've been really talking about on the show, right? Like we've been talking about Chris, like Christendom is no longer having its ceremonies and, and it's no longer warding off these entities and spirits. And that's what's allowing them to rise up in the world around us. So we're seeing these ancient cults arise. Now, when you have right. Christianity all become about like, your your inner self, your feelings, your experience. It's not a, it's not about anything outward anymore. It's not I think about the liturgical grace. reforms. It's not about liturgy. Of, yeah, like the liturgical reforms might be the most devastating thing to ever happen in Christian history. Like I really do think that, not just because of the mass. I'm talking about everything that used to come along with it. So it's like when you really look to um um, like how we converted the pagans part of how we converted the pagans was them seeing our ritual like they thought our ritual was this strange and mysterious thing keeping making the the catechumens leave the mass before the mass of the faithful like keeping the mystery there was something that was very integral inter, integral 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 Integral. That sounds like a good word for it. Integral to how we... Because that's the word for it. Okay. <laughs> Intricate, integral, integral. I was going for one of them. But yeah, it's like, it's it's very much a part of what led people to, like, say, oh, what's going on here? You know, it was like something mysterious and stuff. So, and it also actually is efficacious when you do it properly and the, and the sacraments are confected properly so, and things like that. For those who don't know, what happened was is this was in the, the Diocese of Kansas City. Um, three parishes got a uh, new priest. Um, it's two priests. I would assume one priest has two parish and the other has one. But these new priests come into these parishes and they realize that the wine that has been used at these three parishes is not technically uh it's not valid matter for the Eucharist. So what that means then is that uh, the consecration of, of that wine, when it's not even really technically wine with um, with the additives that were in there, the, the, the consecrations were invalid for the wine, which invalidated every single one of those masses that this happened at. Now, so these were new priests at these parishes, which so the priests that had been there had left and we were probably there yeah. for years five years minimum like that's in our diocese they do every five years they do the pre-shuffle i don't know if that's universal in the, uh, america a lot of like in our diocese like <clears throat> they they shuffle some every year but it usually priests stay for you know maybe 10 years at most give or take right yeah we do the five-year shuffle in our diocese so every five years the priests get the you know the truffle shuffle the so <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to guess it's something. Let's just say it's similar, right? So we don't know if the priests, but if this is three different priests at three different parishes. Or it, it was at least two. At least two parishes. Okay. Right. No, now, no, at also, least two priests. At, oh, okay. It was one of those combined parish things for one of them. So. so we have this story. Then we also have the story a couple of years back where the priests baptism found a baptism video of his own baptism and the priest said we baptize you so this priest was consecrated a priest right like he's incarnated as a priest right performing he's, weddings performing like dude last rites all these things he's performing so, his yeah. priesthood was invalid his he wasn't even a christian technically wasn't even a christian like, wasn't, wasn't confirmed even, wasn't a priest none of them. so none of the marriages he performed uh well, they were they would be valid natural marriages, but they weren't sacramental. Um, That's insane you know, to me. The baptisms he performed would be valid, right? But once again, not uh, the blessings he did for the baptisms wouldn't have been valid. Would have had the same efficacy as if I did it, right? And maybe even less, possibly, because he was doing it as a priest when he wasn't. Yeah. But, so, so now the 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 pushback I got 
why don't you bring my tweet thread up? Well, like so when you when you open it and then go right to the top of it. So God is merciful, so the parishioners would have received validly. So let's get into this, Paul. This is what I want to get into, okay? So here's the thing. We're not because right away I started hearing people saying I was being too legalistic and that do you really think God would punish people for this? No, I do not think God would punish people for this. God, we are bound to the sacraments. God is not, right? So we don't know. Maybe God gave these people the grace. But either the sacraments are what we say they are or they're right. not. Right. Right? Like You, like you I, start going down this path and you start to invalidate, even if you don't cognitively realize it, you start to invalidate everything we believe everything now what would you expect to happen when you okay how about this how about before benedict's vernacular reforms right so i don't know how long you guys have been catholic but i'm catholic long enough to remember under benedict the 16th the 20 the 2012 or something like 2011 or 2012 it was yeah. right around the time when my wife was coming into the church so you know it's like we go from saying uh uh the Lord be with you and also with you too and with your spirit. The mass itself and the consecration goes from saying uh, died for, for, for us, for us men. Uh, wait, what was it? What was it? Uh, I don't know. We died for you and for all to for you and for many. Now this was a very um, contentious argument between this because the scripture says for you and for many, like this is the, this is, the blood of the new covenant, which has been shed for you and for many, is what Christ actually says at the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. And they changed it to this is the blood of the new covenant, which has been shed for you and for all, because it had a very universal salvation feel to it. So people were arguing this, especially uh, if it wasn't for Lefebvre, this may never have been argued, right? Like Lefebvre was like arguing, like you didn't even make a valid consecration. So now from the time of the liturgical changes until Benedict, like, like I don't even know what was going on with those masses. Like, like Benedict comes in and he just tries to tighten it up and says, "Look, let's get a little closer to the Latin here, just to you know, just to cover our bases." You know, like he's now. Paul is right here. Like the the parishioners, they did not receive like sacrilegiously or anything like that. Absolutely. As right. as a matter of fact, it, it, as long as the the, you know as for the the actual host they that the consecration for those would i believe have been valid yeah so the parishioners did receive <clears throat> the body the body our, our lord. right they received our lord in in the host but the mass as a sacrifice was completely invalidated and all all the intentions that mass were set for were unsatisfied satisfied they it received so no sacramental grace like during, during covid I had a priest give me communion, but it wasn't at the mass. Right. So it was like, you know, I would, I went and a priest gave me communion, but I didn't attend mass. I didn't, I didn't, you know, participate in the holy sacrifice of the mass. So that's essentially what happened here. <clears throat> now the church highly, like, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to consecrate the Eucharist outside of the mass. Now this happened unintentionally, right? We hope, we hope it was unintentional. The thing is, in this, like, what infuriates me is it seems like a whole generation of priests just didn't give a rip, right? I mean, they, they so I don't know what they intended. Uh, they just obviously didn't care. Okay, so now when you look universally, the church, we, we look back to, like, end times, <clears throat> types of the end times, right? So if you go back and listen to Father Wolf talks, Father Wolf will tell you, give you a talk on how the, um, mute your mic when you type it up. <clears throat> so like Father Wolf will go and give a talk on how the French Revolution was a type of the end times. So I heard a talk yesterday on how the church has universally understood the Book of Maccabees, Jason, as a type of the end times, right? So Jason usurps the high priesthood for himself and he starts introducing these pagan rituals and hellenism into the temple sacrifice the priests who were supposed to be offering sacrifices stop paying mind to the sacrifices and start 
like getting lazy in how they offer the sacrifices. It just seems like that's a very similar parallel to what's going on right now with our priests. Our priests are so not careful about what they're doing in the holy sacrifice of the mass that they're actually invalidating years worth of masses. Now, what happens when you invalidate years worth of masses? You're actually giving room for these demons to come up and you're allowing the demonic to rise. Look at our culture around us. Uh, now, I understand the sexual revolution happened in the 60s and there would have been some kind of a progression just from allowing that kind of stuff in. But when you do that and then disarm the church on top of it, I just think you you add like an exponential speed to the amount of the demonic rise that we're seeing oh. right now. Imagine if you uh, imagine if you're in the, the diocese, the archdiocese of Kansas City and uh, had a funeral of a relative at one of those parishes. That funeral mass was invalid. And all, like, how, how, like, praying for the dead, you offer masses for the dead. I mean, invalid. Invalid. Wow. People's, people's nuptial mass, invalid. The marriage, of course, still valid. But the mass, you know, they didn't get any graces from the nuptial mass. So that's the thing, right? So it's like, if, if you're going to say that, well, you know, God wouldn't hold it again, we're not saying God's going to punish the parishioners in any way whatsoever like that's not even that's the, the parishioners are a zero fault here and god still may impart grace in them right like we go and yeah. we we have spiritual communions and we believe god gives grace but there's something very real about sanctifying grace from the sacraments like there's something very real about that and yeah. if you're not receiving valid sacraments you're not getting sanctifying grace like it doesn't mean you're going to hell, but it just means like either the sacraments are what we say they are or they're not. Now, if if this is OK, then there's no need for Calvin Robinson to become Catholic and have his orders validated. 100 percent. Right. Right. Because. Yeah, I think about I mean, it. Like, it's, it's like, it, OK, so if it's like, well, God's not legalistic like that, it's like, I, I, isn't he, though? I mean, you don't think he. You, why? Why do we think? In today, yeah, if, if it doesn't matter, it, I mean, if if form and form and matter don't matter to the sacraments, then the invalid form of Anglican ordination doesn't matter. So they must actually be priests. Yeah. Or, or if matter doesn't matter, then what does it matter if uh, some prot somewhere uses Skittles great, and Doritos? Juice and you know, <clears throat> like we are a sacramental faith. Like that means that we use the physical. It, because it represents the incarnation. It's like very incarnational, our faith. And you can't just... So like if you even go through the Twitter thread I sent you, you'll see like the guy yep. starts off saying like, I'm being too legalistic and like, you know, God wouldn't punish these people. And start off sounding reasonable. And as he responds further and further, you see him devolve into admitting he, he just doesn't believe the sacraments or anything. Yeah, so towards the end, I don't want to show it. Be, I don't want necessarily want anyone like piling on this guy's account. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But he, he says, uh, so towards the beginning, he's like, I'm sure God still heard the prayers. I don't think he's so petty as to cross his arms and pout because the wrong, wrong wine was used. And then by the end, um, so you say uh, that the sacraments apart, actual sanctifying grace. Um, and he goes, well, there's not much evidence of this grace. Looking at the history of the church, the scandals, uh, if the Eucharist offered such actual grace and the thought to leave the church would never cross the mind of one who receives it. So, so like you that. said, he, he started from saying, oh, surely God still heard the prayers to, oh, none of this actually means anything anyways. Because if the sacraments actually worked, you wouldn't see the, you wouldn't see people leaving the faith in droves. You but wait a minute. If you receive the Eucharist in a state of mortal sin, not only do you not receive sacramental grace you, from that, it's sacrifying you, grace. You eat and drink damnation upon yourself. Right? So we just went through this the other day. It's like, so yeah, no, you're going to see the complete opposite. Like, and then add into all the sacrilegious communions, which is the sin of Judas, and add into that all the invalid sacraments. And what you're seeing is a logical conclusion to the liturgical reforms like legit like the we should have had a second vatican council like that was uh, the we were supposed to have a second vatican council but we were supposed to address 
the sexual revolution. And we were supposed to address like the, the original schema that they had. And they supposed, trashed supposed those to things. address Vatican one, which was never finished. Yeah. We were supposed but to they really threw all of it out. Fallibility, I think, which was never fully fleshed out. And instead they went and they decided let's do ecumenism. Yeah. Like, we, because Vatican one was, was not finished by Vatican two. We have the dual problem of where Peter is on one side, worshiping Pope Francis instead of a contest on the other, yeah. worshiping the Pope so much they can't, they don't believe Francis could possibly be Pope. Yeah, and I don't know where I fall in the middle of that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> some days I feel on one side, some days I feel on the other. It's it's a hard one, man. It's like in one in one aspect, I'm like, we're the lady. We have absolutely no authority to make any declarations about anyone in the hierarchy, right? Yeah. Like we just don't. We have no authority to make those declarations. On the other hand, you start seeing some of the things that are coming out of the hierarchy, and you're like, there is no possible way this is actually the hierarchy. So it's like, what, like. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. No, don't be said. Hey. No, not yet. Not, I would say there may come a time for that, but you will know God will make it clear. Like that's so like if you're looking typologically, you look at the first century. I'm sorry, I got something in my eye. You look at the first century, right? You have the pe the people of God and Christ comes and the high priest He's the one who opens the key to the bottomless pit and the demons come out and they crucify the Christ. Christ rises, ascends. Now the church starts off as Jews in the temple, right? They're worshiping in the temple alongside other. They're, they're basically a Jewish sect. But at some point they break off and leave the original body, right? Acts 15. So just think about when that, that right? happens. Yeah. So the so the so the so the let's just look at the old testament, the old covenant as a body of the body of of Christ, because it is. It's still about it's not fully formed yet because Christ hasn't come, but it's the old covenant people are a body of people. After Christ's ascension, that body, there's a schism. But this the true church leaves the body, right? So if you're looking typologically. Doesn't it make sense that the high priest is prefigured, the Pope is prefigured the, by the, the high priest? The church didn't leave the Jewish faith. Jews left the right. church. Exactly, right? Yes. So now if you see the church right now leave the faith, look, we know the church is going to, in the end, it has to suffer and go through the passion and follow our Lord in his death and resurrection, right? Like that's that's the catechism. Mm -hmm. I'm not making that up. That's like what the church has to do has to has to follow our Lord and His pa passion, death, and resurrection. So, if the if the main church, if the Pope is prefigured by the high priest, and the high priest is the one who unlocks the key to the bottomless pit. Now, Francis is. Let's just say hypothetically. I'm not saying this is true. Hypothetically, let's say he opened the key to the bottomless pit. That's why all this nonsense is going on. Let's say at the synod they introduce this rainbow stuff into the church. They leave the faith. The resurrected church will have to break off from them and go off, which would be said of at that point, but not really because we know the papacy will endure till the end of time somehow. Mystically, we know like that's, that's part of church teaching, right? So maybe the next council, you end up having a split council. I don't know. Like this is this look, you can't you don't know prophecy until after it's fulfilled. That's you can't always, have a if a council is split, it's not a council. No, but you can I'm, I don't mean a council, I mean a conclave. Okay. A conclave, the next conclave, not the next council. The next conclave could be like so so like you said, what was the longest we ever had an interregnum? Three years? Three years. And this that was in like the thirteen hundreds. Right. So, so Let's just say we go through another after Francis. Let's just say we go through a three, four year period of interregnum, right? Like, let's just say the, the the conclave can't figure things out, and the the church itself, like, you don't need to be under Peter for it to go crazy. Maybe that without it being under Peter is what makes it go crazy. Look, you don't know prophecy until after it's fulfilled. It's never filled the way you think it's going to be. Like, you don't mm -hmm. understand it until it's fulfilled. And then you look back and you go, oh, that's how all those things fit. So we're just going hypothetical here. But, right, like, let's say 
let's say this synod gets enacted and then let's say you know hypothetically francis passes on and they go to a conclave and there's an interregnum for years and this like legit set of a content because there's no hope because of that well except that's, that's not that's not really that's not set of a conte in the sense this it's an interregnum of, right but the right, body yeah. can schism during that interregnum and now you have a conclave held outside of Rome, and you have a like you're talking about. You're getting where you have actual competing, competing claimants to claimants the, to the to the chair of Peter to the chair of Peter. Like that's all I'm saying. Like I'm not, another I'm, like another Great Western Schism, another Avignon something like Papacy, that, yeah. something like that. Yeah. So like what, what I'm saying, um, what about apostolic succession? How does that change apostolic succession? Um, yeah, because that just, that happens. From like from within a C from bishop to bishop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're not listen, we're just going hypothetical here. We're not saying this is what happened. We're not telling anybody to go anywhere. We're just going hypothetical. Look, you don't know until afterward. Look, if you get a very holy pope next, you're going to see a schism. <laughs> I think. Like I think you'll if you get a holy pope after Francis, you're going to see that Yeah, the and Germans they, and Slim Jim are gonna yeah, be they're going. Like they're not staying. Now they may elect their own pope. And that Pope will be the Pope of the world and the faithful will break off from that main body. They may keep the churches. Hey, hey, so the apostolic succession does not need approval from the Vatican. This is why set of do yeah, have, have bishops. Now there's some questionable lines of succession, like the Thuk line. I, I mean, apparently he was pretty crazy and no one knows for sure, but I mean, there are val. I mean, the Eastern Orthodox have valid lines of apostolic su succession. Yeah. Uh, in England did until their orders went invalid. You know, the the arch yeah. the bishop of Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah, there, there were years after Henry the Eighth split from Rome where there were still valid masses going on. Right. Yes. There were still valid until, until Cranmer and the changes to ordination and all right. that. Yeah. There was a there was a period where even though they split from Rome, there were still valid Catholic masses happening. So it's look, this is just this is we said we weren't going to talk about the apocalypse. <laughs> it, but now, as far as car, yes, so so priests and bishops and even deacons are incarnated into as cardinals by the Pope. And right now, canon law says that. Cardinals are who elects the Pope, so that would that would be thorny to say the least. Okay, sorry, my wife. Was, can you hear me? Yeah, my wife was asking me something. Um, yeah, it's like I just think things are going to get very weird in the next two years or three years. And I mean, I, they've been weird now for a decade. So since Francis, right? Like, and and things have look. You're seeing things now that even though things have been crazy since the council, like when Benedict was in, if a priest came out in support of women's ordination, he would be like in trouble. Like he would actually lose faculties. You know, Benedict would pull him out. National Catholic reporter, their bishop would tell them you can't use the name Catholic. The New Ways ministry was forbidden from speaking in dioceses and actual parishes. Now, people would disobey, but there was still clear instruction from Rome that you could not do these things. Those rules are completely out the window now. Like, not only that, but James Martin is the poster child for the Francis papacy. Mm-hmm. So you can't tell me we're not in something bizarre, like at minimum. This is so bizarre. And if you're not confused by this, I don't, if you're like so confident, like, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand your confidence. I'm worried. I'm scared. I don't, not that I'm scared, but like I'm confused. Right. It's, I, it's, it's not like um, there's no lack of confidence here in the church. No. Because we I, were promised that's never going to fail. Absolutely. Of course. Now th that's the other thing. Like, what, what, like, it's like Christ promised the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates won't prevail, but it may look like it for a while. Like it's going to be a battle. He had to give us that promise to ensure us like, guys, don't worry. It's going to get crazy, but the gates of hell will not prevail. But they may look as if they did for a while. Like it's going to be scary in, in that aspect. Right. Mm -hmm. But they won't prevail and you will have it. It's just like those periods where we had a split papacy and you had three claimants to the throne and you had like the, the church goes through these insane times. And then somehow Christ 
puts it back on track and the gates of hell don't prevail. This is a good question. I'm looking to convert from Protestantism. How do I know my local Catholic church is a good one? What do I look for? Um, Shelly, I would... Uh, if it still seems similar to where you used to, run. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would actually... I would privately... I would ask you to tell me what diocese you're in, and I'll try to make sure you get hooked up in a... I mean, I'll, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk publicly. I don't want to give too much of your info away. But if you if you're on Telegram, um, or if you want to send me a send me your email but somehow, if you my you know, I guess my general suggestion would be you have to discern what that priest and what that parish really cares for. Uh, do they do they use all the buds you know buzzwords like? Do you think they care more about being welcoming? and inclusive and all that or do they care more about saving people's souls because that's the type of church you want to find paul i misspoke when i said scared i didn't mean scared i meant like it's not so certain right it's like it's not, of course i'm not scared I'm, I'm i think it's the most exciting time in the world to be catholic in all honesty like i think it's exciting that we are seeing such an such a um a, a, like a an important part of the christian narrative playing out before our eyes like i think it's an amazing time to be catholic it's confusing but we will see things that i don't think we ever thought would happen because i think that's how prophecy plays out like just like the jews in the first century never thought their messiah was going to be the way jesus comes they never thought he would come. And I, and I think this also, the people who do, the Jews who do recognize him as the Messiah, go and repent and have a humble heart and are repentant for their sins. Now, I think that is the mode everyone has to be in. It's like, don't think you know everything. Go in and say, God, wherever you are leading me, I will follow. I don't know what is going on right now, but I don't need to know. Right now, I am a lay person. I have no authority to make any claims about anybody in the hierarchy. If you want me to leave, make it clear to not just me, but the whole church. You know, and if you look at, if you look at the past and at, at the times where it was the, the most confusing and most difficult, not that on one hand, not that our time is any different, but at the same time, not that any time has necessarily been as bad as now, because I think there's a mix of both of that, but um, the times where it's been rough, afterwards have been the times of the greatest saints i mean you yeah. had you had the french revolution and the napoleonic wars and the enlightenment and then you had saint john you know saint john vianney um you know you had you had like the great western schism but then you had saint catherine of uh, siena and saint vincent for the and reformation that, and then you get saint ignatius and you get ignatius saint, saint francis, francis xavier yeah, and like, saint, on, you know man. uh and cajetan and charles borromeo and uh, you know, Robert Bellarm. I mean, think of what that generation produced. Can you believe yeah. that? I mean, just yeah, naming think, them. Holy crap. Yeah. It's, it's, I think that we are in for some really interesting and exciting times as the church. I'm just, I, my thing is the, the, I'm, tr I'm trying to really, I, I'm trying to take <laughs> Benedict, uh, back when Jesuits were special forces. <laughs> Yeah, back when they made uh, Protestants so scared, they came up with crazy conspiracy theories. Yeah, they really did. Uh, Tom Holland Talking believes. To Tom Holland, yeah. Tom Holland, <laughs> Tom Holland says, he goes, you know, when I would, I would, I, the, the Jesuits scared me so much. When I would see a cardinal, I thought they were off to poison a nunnery. <laughs> but the, um, yeah, it's just, it's going to be different than you think. Like anybody who's so confident that they know and, oh, the Antichrist is coming, you don't know anything. Like, and anybody who puts dates and times on things, they don't know anything. They're a liar. It's just none of us know. And we're all trying to make sense of this thing right now, I think. And yeah. I, think most, I think most of the people that watch this show are, feel pretty similar to where we are. We're just like, we don't know, but we're here for the ride. I still love Jesus. I still love the church. It and along the way, we're going to laugh at women drivers who drive on, uh, <laughs> who drive even without a rim. 